Tonight we have an interesting subject, the Forbidden City. And of course some of you are asking, what's the Forbidden City got to do with the Gospel? So be patient with me. But before I talk about the Forbidden City, let me first talk about the Forbidden Fruit. There is some connection there. Okay, as you, all of you know, before the fall of man, man and God had very loving and intimate fellowship. In Genesis, the Bible puts it this way, that God would in the cool of the day come in fellowship with Adam. And I suspect that there was absolutely no mystery with Adam about God. No second guess. There was such a loving relationship and it was a kind of face-to-face -face fellowship. And remember, man had not seen yet. Man was holy, like God. Born of God, really. And so... There was not a ripple of fear in man. And he was totally whole, spirit, soul, and body. And so the two had intimate fellowship. And that was the will of God. And Adam could reach out to God in a very personal way. There was no gulf fix, no barrier whatsoever. And there was, of course, before the great fall of man. But as you know, man has been created as free moral agents. We have the power of choice. And I think that probably is the root problem because men cannot handle that, that great privilege. Just like some angels they cannot handle that great privilege. One third of them fell off because Lucifer, the leader, used his free will given by God against God. And then in the Garden of Eden, the same thing happened to man. But it all began with the forbidden fruit, really, in the Garden of Eden where Adam and Eve were. And the garden was, I mean, so well provided for. Temperature just right. All the available sustenance was there. There was many allowances in the garden except for one prohibition. And that's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I got to thinking lately a couple of days ago, why is it called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Why wasn't that tree called by another name, the tree of evil, period? Because evil came as a result. Then I got to thinking and I thought to myself, perhaps in the first instant, God did not want man to have a mixture of good and evil. God wanted man, and he still wants man, to be good, period. No evil. Now in the book of James, we are told that can a spring gush out both sweet and bitter water? Can a, a man be both good and evil. And as we look around, because the world has been so tainted, we have to admit what the spring cannot do, man in the sinful nature can do. Because James asked the question, can the spring gush forth both sweet and bitter water? It's impossible for a fountain to produce at the same time good and evil. But man has that capability. Somebody once said that 
there is something bad in the best of men. And there is something good in the worst of men. And I think if you live long enough, you've got to admit it's profound, but it's true. There's a Dr. Jekyll and a Mr. Hyde in all of us. Why? Because the Bible tells us since the fall of man, we were all born and shaped in iniquities in our mother's womb. And that's a fact. So very often when a person has been caught for a hideous crime and then it's all over the newspapers and the neighbor said, how could that be possible? He has been my neighbor for many years, a very quiet gentleman, a very kind-hearted man. And it's so often like that. Why? Because there's good and evil in the same person. And isn't it strange that that tree in the middle of the garden beside the tree of life is called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? And a man could be capable of doing something good to someone and something bad to another person. Good and evil. And that is not what God wants. God wants us to be holy, to be good. Despite people doing us bad things, we are to respond with love and kindness. And Jesus came to give that Example. So, when men fell, the Lord was showing the first parents we have that the only way to forgiveness is for an innocent animal to die on behalf of him. And so both Adam and Eve were totally naked and they were ashamed because sin entered into the wall. And they tried to cover themselves with fig leaves. And that's a way of man trying to create his own religion, to cover their nakedness, their own way. But God took an innocent animal and slayed it without the shedding of blood, especially from an innocent person or an innocent animal, there can be no remission or forgiveness of sin. And Adam and Eve, for the first time, saw with their own eyes a lively creature created by God went limp. Blood poured forth, a hideous sight, and then was dead. It's a very unpleasant thing to watch. You know, till today, there is this news report about animals being cruelly slaughtered, the cows. And it showed in the news for a few days do you know, the first time I saw it, it set me thinking for hours. The second time it came, I turned away. I could not bear to watch that. None of us could bear to watch an innocent animal being cruelly killed. Of course, some of us couldn't understand, is there a merciful way to kill? Well, I guess so. I mean... If somebody comes and pull my nails one by one and then slice me bit by bit, that would be cruel. But if somebody say, close your eyes, and I think it's not pretty sight, but I think I prefer that. You know what I'm talking about. You know, I would anytime prefer that. The other news clip that they often show these days, I cannot bear to watch is this young man, you know, was shot point blank like that. You, you saw it, isn't it? You know, 
when we see the taking of a life, something stirs within us, doesn't it? It's just awful, beyond words. And so, for our first parents who had never eaten meat, they, they ate, you know, vegetables and fruits and so forth. In fact, if you read your Bible carefully, even the animals didn't eat each other up. Do you know that? Until the great flood, and then when they, you know, came down and the water subsided, God gave man, first time, the permission to be meat eaters. And I often wonder why, you know. I still don't have the answer. I, I just wish God didn't say, go eat meat. I wish, you know, he said, eat bananas, you know, especially durians. And, you know, keep surviving on that. It will be good for you. But, but since now we have, perhaps it's because of the sacrifice of Christ and the foreshadow was an innocent animal. Perhaps. I don't have all the answers. But anyway, right there and then, an innocent animal was being slaughtered. And of course, that foreshadowed Jesus Christ, the once and for all sacrifice on the cross, cruelly slaughtered, wounded from the crown of his head to the soles of his feet, literally. You know? And so that innocent animal foreshadowed Jesus Christ. But in that time period, an innocent animal would do. Go by God's way. But today, thank God, not an innocent animal's blood, but the blood of Jesus Christ that we accept for our pardon. Now, Satan will always try to influence us for evil. How? By a perversion of the truth. And, you know, right in the Garden of Eden, the the very first lie that Satan told Eve and, and how he wormed his way to influence her. He, he first came and said, did God say that you must not eat of the fruits of this garden? Now, God didn't say that. Of course not. And Eve made the first mistake by having a friendly chat with the devil. She said, no, we can eat freely, but only one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We, we mustn't eat it, because the day we eat of it, we shall die. And the devil said, ah, that's where you missed it. You are not going to die. In fact, I'll tell you what happened, okay? When you eat of it, you're going to be like God. Your eyes will be open. You will know things you have never known before. Now, through those sentences, he was actually insinuating that God was hiding something good from man. You see how the devil always would give you an excuse and a reason to sin. Yeah. Something is good here. If you are going to, you know, uh, be employed in a questionable profession, the devil would say, yeah, but you see, the money you receive now, you could help poor people. Yeah, it's a little shady, but, but then you can, you know, bring joy to your family. You can help the poor, really, with the money, you know. And they were kind of equalized with God anyway. See, the devil would have some kind of an excuse for you. So the devil was tempting Eve. Eat it. You become wise. Your mind will be open and, and you'll be like God. Now today the New Age movement, you've heard of it. Essentially what the New Age movement is teaching is all of us are gods. We may not realize it now. But as we go along, 
you know. And especially after all the reincarnations you go through, you become perfected, all of us will be gods in our own right. In other words, there are no laws applicable to you. You can do what you want, you call the shots, you set the rules, and you're not accountable. I think that's the bottom line. You're not accountable. And people think the New Age movement is a, a kind of new movement. Oh no. This concept, you are God, actually went back to the Garden of Eden. And in ancient China, and this is where we are going to talk about the Forbidden City, all the ancient emperors were regarded as gods. But at least not so rampant like today with the New Age movement. A lot of people, common people think, I'm God. See, if I just practice and be more conscious I'm God, it would be better for me. But one day all of us will be conscious that we are gods. But the Ming dynasty, that emperor began to build this biggest palace the world had ever seen. And I believe even today, it is still the biggest palace in the world. When they first built it, they believed it was in the center of the nation, even in the center of the whole universe. In those days, the Chinese thought that they were the most superior nation of the earth. When those foreigners came, they called them loquai, means foreign devils. These are all barbarians, you know. We are very cultured. Our emperor's palace is in the center of the whole universe. So the Ming dynasty began building this humongous palace. I tell you, it took them 10 years just together plan all the manpower and material. Ten years to plan and together the manpower material. And when the work first commenced, over a hundred thousand men, over a hundred million bricks, over two hundred million cows, and they depleted probably a, a small forest of trees to provide the wood. They had an ingenious way of interlocking the wood without using one single nail. It was a, a palace on a grand scale, very sophisticated in ancient times. And, and, and the whole color scheme was full of gold and yellow and red. And red, of course, represents good luck, yellow, power, gold, divinity, because the emperor was divine. And that was before the skyscrapers. They had this building called the Supreme Harmony Hall where all the important occasions were held. And it was the tallest building of the whole nation at that time. And there were 9,999 rooms for the glory of one man. They call him the son of heaven, the emperor, the son of heaven. I did a research, why 9,999 rooms? Why not 10,000 rooms? Then the story goes this way. You see, this son of heaven was sent by the Father of Heaven. And the Father of Heaven has 10,000 rooms. So the Son is not equal to the Father, according to their theology. So in deference to the Father, He humbly minus one room. So 9,999 rooms. What a filial son. You know, but of course there's no truth in it. The emperor wasn't the son of heaven. He wasn't God. He would die like anybody else. And today you could not even find all the emperor's ashes, I think. 
But then for 600 years, it, the, that forbidden city was home to 24 emperors and every one of them died. Turned to ashes and then nothingness. They were being worshipped as gods. Few had seen them. The emperors would create an aura of mystery so that people would worship him. In fact, the last emperor, Pui, when he wanted to install a telephone, and you know the telephone in those days, not the slick little handphone you carry. It was always hung on the wall, two pieces. Hello, hello, hello. You, you saw the movie, you know. And they, they wanted to install that telephone, but the officials objected to it. Why? Because they said, Emperor, people should not have easy, easy access to you. You know? How could they just dial a number and call the emperor? You are God. By that time, Puyi wasn't that stupid. I think he knew he wasn't God. So he ordered, commanded the telephone to be installed. And according to his own autobiography, yeah, hello, hello, he did many, many times to many people. He, he was a prisoner in his own forbidden city. Not only people were forbidden to come in, he was forbidden to go out. You know, his life story, a very pathetic one. You see? So, the, the, the sad thing about the last emperor is this. When the, uh, the, the, the new government under Chiang Kai-shek was about to take power, they were still quarreling as to how to fold a tablecloth. You see those eunuchs and those lots of concubines and servants and officers, they were majoring on minors. They were about to lose the forbidden city and all their position. Nobody would want to care for the king anymore. They were arguing about the right way to lay and to fold a tablecloth. Who cares? See? They, they were getting crazy, you know? But because you know the story in those days, the forbidden city was so forbidden to the common man that if you were to pry and to enter illegally, they put you to death. Just forbidden. Why? It's the home of the God, the emperor. What a big lie. And, and think of it, for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, people living under the big illusion. But every God emperor died. Every one of them. And the great irony with the last emperor, Puyi, is that he was evicted from the forbidden city by the communists. When Chiang Kai-shek was in power, he allowed the emperor to remain in the palace. But when Mao Zedong took over, they not only evicted him, they imprisoned him. And Puyi was acting like, a, like an emperor, but in the rehab center, he did not even know how to tie his own shoelace. You think of it. Oh, he had to learn from scratch like a little baby, you know? And in the end, they rehabilitated him. They made him a gardener. The emperor became a humble gardener. And Mao Zedong, fearing that people will reinstall the emperor again, he turned the whole forbidden city into a public, they, he called it palace museum. Any common man could walk in for a fee. So, today, common men walked where emperors used to trod. You can do that too. I, I did it a year over ago. Pay a fee, walk like an emperor in a forbidden city. Nobody would chop your head off. You know? And when I was there one over a year ago, it didn't look too clean. I mean, old wood and, you know, you peer inside the uh, 
grand room, you would not live in it. It's musty, and, you know, very gloomy looking. I look at, although they restore the forbidden city, I look at the towels and the walls, neat painting really, you know. Not as nice as this church, I think, or the one over in Tampines. You know, but I told myself, but this is where the emperor gods lived once upon a time. You know? And you know the greatest irony when Puyi became a gardener was free men to walk about. He wanted to visit the forbidden city, his home. You know what he had to do? He had to pay a fee to get in. He lined up just like anybody else paid the fee, got the ticket, and he went in to look at it. And you know what he said? He wrote in his autobiography. He said, it looked newer than when I was here before, he said. You know, (laughs) because the Chinese government restored it, new paint, and so forth. And you know, Pui, before he was being taken by the communists, and he freely wrote in his life story, he longed to be the emperor once again. The Japanese came along, made him a puppet emperor in a northern state called Manchu Kuok, where he was emperor with no power whatsoever. That's why, according to a lot of Chinese, Pui should be shot dead for betraying the Chinese people. But it was a good thing Mao Zedong for some reason liked him. So gave him a chance. But you see how he wanted the throne back and be gone. If you don't know the history of Pui, the last emperor, he was enthroned, you know, at the age of three. When he was being enthroned, put on that big throne, he still could remember he was crying, I don't like it here. I want to go home, I want to go home. You know? And all the eunuchs were frantic and trying to say, shh, but that's the emperor. And they all bowed. He was wondering why everyone bowed down to him. You see, he knew better, I'm not emperor. Why are you all bowing down to me? It scares me to death. So he cried. But all of them bowed down. Small and big, young and old, female and males, all bowed down before him. He got a taste of being God. And so when his country was in trouble, he did not really care for the country. All he wanted was to be treated like God. Isn't that very sad? So today, the New Age movement talks about we are all gods. And we think, oh, this is a new revelation. No, it's an ancient one. You know, if we go back to the ancient China, you want to go back further? The Garden of Eden. Where the devil comes to you and says, you know, if you disobey God, you are, you are God yourself. Why do you subject yourself to God? So, there is no God. And you are God. But let's look at the emperor of emperors, the king of kings the Lord of Lords. You see, false power puffs up, but genuine power humbles. Because recorded in Philippians, the second chapter, I'm going to read to you the first 11 verses. It says here, Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and one mind. Here, Paul is saying, if you are really touched by the Spirit of God, if you really love God, then you've got to be united and have the same kind of mind. You know, having the same attitude, having the same love and remain in unity. Okay. Then verse 3 he says, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. You know, don't do anything because of your just selfish ambition, just for yourself. 
and conceit, thinking yourself highly than you ought to think. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Now, I had a problem with this latter part of the verse. You know, I'm supposed to esteem, you know, the people I meet better than myself. Oh, there are people I can, but there are people I cannot. Then I learn one thing. Even a person who is perhaps lower than me in the station of life, if I observe him closely, he has some character traits or some abilities that I don't have. And once I discover that truth, I begin to respect even sometimes a young believer who would say something that would set me thinking the whole day. You know? Then I begin to realize God has put within us all kinds of giftings and talents and abilities to complement one another. So it is easy now for me to esteem another pe person. Then verse 4, let each of you look out not only for his own interests. If you say, I am God, then of course everybody serve me, right? But the Bible says, don't just look out for your own interests, but also for the interests of others. I remember when Pui was angry when he was just a teenager. You know, he would line all the poor eunuchs in one straight line. And he would tell them, and it was not their fault. He was just not in a good mood. For entertainment, he told them, turn to each other, not hug each other, slap each other. And kept on, blow harder, harder. And those poor eunuchs, they slapped one another. And after that, he wasn't through with them. He would take the ink, you know, in those days you have this calligraphy, black ink, and he told them, drink, everybody drink. And those poor eunuchs would drink. Why? He is God. Yeah. But look at the emperors of emperors. Yeah. His word says, don't just look out for your own interests, but also the interests of others. And then verse 5, and this is the heart of the message. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. In other words, let this same attitude that was displayed by Christ when he was on earth, let this same attitude be your attitude, be your mindset. And then it goes on to describe what he did out of selflessness. Verse 6, who being in the form of God. Now we are talking about God who created the heavens and the earth. You know? we, we're not talking about a God who would send a million workmen to build the great wall of China and to hell with them. If they die, let them perish. If their family members you know, long for them, who cares? We're not talking about a God like that. And that person wasn't God in the first place. We're talking about a genuine God who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Why? Because God the Son was equal with God the Father as He was equal to God the Holy Spirit. And this is a mystery we don't understand, the Godhead. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Three in one. And you cannot divide them and they are equally God. But what did Jesus do? Verse 7, But made Himself of no reputation. Taking the form of a born servant and coming in the likeness of man. In other words, God who created the heavens and the earth God, whom the heavens and the earth could not contain, he became a man. The emperor of emperors. You know, he became a man. While man wanted to be God, to be like God, to take the place of God, so was Lucifer. He wanted to take the place of God. But God, in order to save us, in order to be like that innocent animal, shedding his precious blood, he became a man. You see the contrast between a puff-up, puny little man who demands worship 
And God himself, 2,000 years ago, became a man. In verse 8, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Now some of you may be asking, why should God become a man and then die for us? Because the justice of heaven demands it. And remember, the justice of heaven is not like the justice on earth. So pure. You know, you cannot let Sin, just get away with it. But then, because of God's love, something must pay the price on behalf of a sinner because God loves us so much. And it so happened that Jesus took the brunt of it. He came down as a man. And like a silent lamb before slaughter, he didn't argue, he didn't fight for his life. He was led like a silent lamb. And one thing I could not stand watching also, sometimes in documentary they show you the sacrifice still made in some Middle Eastern nations. You know, a sheep leading to be slaughtered. Just the sight of a person leading a sheep to the slaughterhouse makes me so sick in my stomach. Reminds me of Jesus Christ. He opened up his mouth, not, not at all, but to lay down his life for our sins. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him. Now, I want you to know that just because God became a man and Jesus died on our cross, he's going to be weak all the time. No. It's only to purchase for our salvation. But one day, verse 9 is going to happen. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. Verse 10, that at the name of Jesus, and you're going to see it. I don't care what you believe. You know, one day you're going to think back to this night. And you say, ah, oh, how true that is. You're going to hear, you're going to see it. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That day is going to come. You mark my words. You know? So I don't want to paint to you that Christianity is an important, weak religion. Jesus dying on the cross helplessly. He did that simply because there was no way out for our sin. There is no one to forgive us our sin. There is no one to take away our sin. There is no one to give us power over it. None. And so Jesus came. He was the only one qualified. He willingly gave up his life, but he also took it up when the price was paid. Where is Jesus today? He's right here with us in the Spirit, over in Tampines as well. But one day every eye shall see him. One day. Every eye. Even those who cursed him now, they shall see him. Because there's only one God. You know, our gospel really is the greatest in every sense of the word. You see, John 3.16, most of you know by heart, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Why is the gospel the greatest? Let me break those, uh, those small parts of that verse for you. For God, the greatest personality, so loved with the greatest kind of love, who would die for you. That he gave the greatest gift. His only begotten son, the greatest sacrifice. That whoso 
ever the greatest choice. Believeth in him the greatest realization. Should not perish the greatest escape. We're talking about hell. Now, whoso ever believeth in him should not perish the greatest escape but the greatest difference have the greatest possession everlasting joy the greatest everlasting life the greatest joy and the greatest bliss I say that all over for you one more time for God the greatest personality so love the greatest kind of love. The world, the greatest company of people. That he gave the greatest gift. His only begotten son, the greatest sacrifice. That whosoever, the greatest choice, believeth in him, the greatest realization, should not perish the greatest escape, but the greatest difference, have the greatest possession, everlasting life, the greatest joy and bliss. Now tonight, I offer him to you. This greatest person whom the heaven and earth could not contain could humble himself one more time because of his great love for you and become containable into your little heart and be with you. For God so loved you that he gave his only son to die for you, that you may not perish. How wonderful to know that when your life is all over, and regardless what people believe about hell and how terrible it is, it's not your concern why you're not going there. And why is it? Because you believe and trust Jesus Christ, your Savior. He's the Emperor of Emperors, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, and yet He's your Savior tonight. Shall we all rise to our feet? And we are going to ask you, for those of you who say, Yes, Pastor Ronnie, I, I want this Jesus in my life. And in my heart, I want my life to be changed. I want him to give me power. So would you step out of your seat? Would you come to the front? So I can pray for you and with you. Okay, those of you at the top balcony, all you need to do is walk down to your level. Someone will meet you. But those of you at the lower balcony, there are two side staircases, one on the left, one on your right. Take those staircases, walk down confidently, come to the front here, and we're going to pray for you. And tonight you're going to go home with the peace and the assurance that Jesus Christ is your Lord and your Savior. Yes, that's it. Come quickly. Those of you in Tampines, would you make your way? Yes, I see you coming. God bless you as you come. Okay, those of you in Tampines, God bless you. If you have come with friends too shy to come down, would you ask the friend, do you understand what the preacher is talking about? And if you understand you want it, can I walk you down? Okay. So walk the friend down the aisles. Let's stretch our hands to these precious souls. Those of you standing at the altar, would you lift your hands to Jesus, your Savior, as an act of surrender? That's right. Close your eyes now. Just close your eyes and would you repeat this prayer out loud with me. Just say, Dear Lord Jesus, I stand before you recognizing I'm a sinner and I need a savior. You are the only savior of the world because you are sinless and you came into this world willingly suffered and died for my sins. You shed your precious blood to cleanse me and how I need your cleansing. So tonight I come boldly because you invite me to come to receive your forgiveness, your cleansing, 
and also to acknowledge that you are my Lord and my Savior. I open up my heart and I invite you. Come into my heart and stay within me to guide me, to help me, to strengthen me, to empower me. I want to belong to you, not just for now, but from now until eternity. I want to worship you as my Lord. You are indeed the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and yet you humble yourself to die for me and to come into my life. Make yourself real to me. From tonight onwards, I worship you as the only God of this universe and the only Lord of my life. Please protect me and bless me. I ask all this in Jesus' mighty name. And all God's people say, give him a shout. Thank you, Lord. The rest of you, you may be seated. Those of you receiving a book tonight, would you read it? Then come to join us in church tomorrow. Okay. Now, probably some of you don't know, after hearing the message about this emperor of emperors, Jesus Christ, humbled himself to die on the cross for us. What really did he do? Well, he performed miracles when he was on earth, assuring us that he would do more than just dying for our sins. He would also die to pay for our sicknesses as well, to keep us healthy in our bodies. And in my lifetime, I tell you, I've seen many men of God and women of God as well. Because of their faith in Jesus, they are kept healthy all the days of their life, live up to a ripe old age, and then just surrender themselves to the Lord when they have to go without sickness in their bodies. They just expire and then go home to be with Jesus Christ. And in this church, we believe that we can believe like that, you know. We can, we can order our life according to the Word of God and live in such a way full of faith and full of love in response to people and helping them and so forth that we live a healthy life all the time, you see, and live what I call in divine life, you know. And, and we can do that. But for those of you who are sick, and this is the first time you are exposed to the gospel. Let me give you the good news. When Jesus hung upon the cross, He not only took our sins, He also took our sicknesses and diseases as well. It's legal. Therefore, tonight when you come for prayer, as we invite you, you've got to understand it is Jesus' mandate that we do it. You know, it is not something some, some men think out of their own imagination. Okay, we have a miracle service. Oh no. You know, it is ordered of the Lord according to the Bible. And we are doing in obedience to the great commission of Jesus Christ. So physically, He went home. In the spirit, He's with us. And the work has been passed on to us. And the amazing thing is this. Some of the Christians who are going to be praying for you and with you have not been a long time Christians. You say, why? Well, God healed them and touched them so that you also can be healed and touched. Then one day when you've been touched, you also will touch other people. Now, do you see this glorious plan that God has? It is not something that, oh, only the pastors can do. Are you glad you're serving a God that has no mystery, you know, no unnecessary mystery like men. We're going to keep, you know, the secrets. Only those wearing funny costumes can do certain things. No. See? Then, then they will add value to the pastors. We can strut around like a peacock, you know. But no, we are telling you that our God is so open hearted that even a young Christian, and we have heard of cases like that, people just got saved. You know, and the next week or so, they not only lead somebody to Christ, they pray for the sick and the sick recover. Isn't our God a good God? He sounds like God, 
doesn't he? You know, not trying to protect secrets. Oh no, you know. And you getting healed is so simple. When you get healed, you should not be asking the question, how come I get healed? I, I'm, I wasn't a really good person. You get healed not because you're a good person. You get healed because you believe. Now, if you can catch that, you can get healed. Now, so those of you who are thinking, will God heal me? You know, I did something. I, it doesn't matter. You, are, you get healed because you trust God. You believe. That weak area, God is going to deal with you as you walk together. Do you understand? Some people say, but I smoke, you know. Well, get healed first, you know. In next to no time, you won't be smoking. You know? So then don't let your smoking prevent you from for getting your healing tonight. I like to tell this joke. One time, somebody said, you know, Pastor, I'm very worried for my salvation. I said, why? Do you have Jesus in your heart? He said, yes, I have Jesus in my heart, you know. But then, because I smoke, you see, can I get to heaven? I said, well, you probably get there faster than I do if you keep smoking. Are you getting it? You know, but of course we have seen many people after they have tasted the goodness of God and they sincerely prayed about it, the habit was gone. You see, but don't let anything hinder you from coming to Christ to get your healing. Okay? Keep in your mind as you stand up afterwards that I'm going to get healed because I believe Jesus. I'm not getting healed because I'm a good person, you know, or I'm more intelligent than the average. No, 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 no. You get healed because you believe. Okay? Now I see the light coming out, so we, we are ready to pray. Okay? So those of you who want to be healed by Jesus and you believe, would you stand to your feet? Okay? Those of you who want to come to the front here, okay? You can make your way to the front. Those of you who want to stay where you are, just stay where you are, be comfortable. Treat this like a, a, a big family, okay? Now, one or two of you may be feeling, I don't want people to look at me. Hey, listen, nobody's looking at you. They are, they are too engrossed with their own self. So please, just stand up, you know. No one is looking at you. There are so many people who want to be healed. So don't forego your healing just because you feel a little embarrassed. You know, where you are, just stand up. And you're going to boldly receive your healing from Jesus. Your body is going to get stronger. Thank you, Jesus. Take a hand quickly, put it on the part of your body that needs healing. If you have a heart condition, over your heart, stomach condition, over your heart, a back condition, over your back, an eye that gives you problem, over that eye or both eye, a ear that gives you trouble, put a finger in that ear. If you don't know where to place a hand, place it over your head like this, okay? And begin to pray where you are. Just talk to Jesus. He's so close to you, as close to you as your breath. So you just talk to Jesus. He loves you. He understands. He knows you through and through. So you don't have to mince your word. You just have to say, Lord, I need your healing. I know no one can help me. You know, just tell him. And Lord, I'm going to trust you for my healing. Heal me. Even right now, Lord, touch me. A very simple prayer. Yes, I can. Some of you are praying real good. Simple words. That's it. Just a little above a whisper. God sees your heart. Thank you, Lord. Oh, Father, you are so gracious. I give you praise. I give you praise that you are so gracious. You are visiting everyone as if he or she is the only person in the sanctuary because you are so personal to that person. And Lord, you bore those sicknesses, those diseases 2,000 years ago. So, Lord, Make it a reality. Manifest it even tonight in this place and over in Tampines. Hallelujah. And now we command Satan, you and all your oppressive spirits are bound. We command it by the authority of Jesus Christ. In the mighty name of Jesus, you that are oppressing the bodies of every one of these, you must release your clutch. You must release your hold. You are defeated in the name of Jesus. We defeat you by the blood of the Lamb 
and the testimony of the word of God in the mighty name of Jesus Christ be bound and be rendered inoperative depart in Jesus mighty name release your hope right now and Holy Spirit come with all of your full power tonight in two centers two healing centers oh God and Lord God strengthen them touch them oh God heal them oh God in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, touch them, touch them. Yes, let all the pain, all the discomfort go away in Jesus' name. Get into the root cause, oh precious Holy Spirit, and take out that root cause tonight. By the power of Jesus Christ, we thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. Now, if you have finished praying, would you just test your healing? Those of you with eyesight trouble would you look around just look around by faith in Jesus mighty name those of you with a year problem shut the good year and begin to listen out of the other one okay consciously if you cannot lift up a hand lift up a hand don't be afraid of the pain just lift it up put down lift up again and then claim God's promise and say Jesus you died for me on the cross you took my sickness you have it, I don't. And then lift your hand. Those of you with arthritic fingers, which you close into a palm, those fingers into a palm and open and close again. You know, do something you could not do. Back condition, you bend over where you are. Now, as soon as you know you are healed, would you come and give God all the glory? Some of you have been healed last week or a few weeks before or even a few months before didn't get a chance would you make up your mind to give glory to God so that others will be encouraged and inspired okay and God will be pleased okay so don't be afraid you know praise God now think of something you could not do or you did it with pain when you came in and do that action again and again and claim the healing praise God yeah, Joyce what do we have Pastor, Brother Yo actually was saying that it is by God's grace he's standing here to give God all the glory. Wonderful. Yeah, it was in early June. He went for a holiday in China and one morning he woke up, he says that he felt the breathing and there's bubbles in the lungs. Mm. And then uh, later on he found that, you know, his lips turned dark, the tongue turned white mm. and it was very serious. And in the group, he saw that you know, uh, he needed to uh, be admitted to the hospital. When he was admitted to the hospital, and that place was quite... Uh, what hospital was that? It's a military hospital. Okay. A rustic military hospital. Military hospital. My oxygen level had fallen to a very dangerous level. Mm. Immediately, I was given oxygen and the drips. Okay. Four big tanks of oxygen mm. in the one week, mm. in the six days. Okay. And then I saw my level had dropped to 55. Which is a dangerous situation. Below 90, we need oxygen. So you went below 55? I went to 55. Okay. For four days and nights, okay. it could hardly come out to 85. Mm. Okay. So it was in that dangerous level and uh, the wife was with her, was with him and uh, you know, quickly activate prayers and then to get pastors in Singapore, pastor team and some of the gospel writers and start praying for him. And he came out of it and, uh, and uh, he, he took actually a couple of hours you know, to travel back to Singapore. And he says that it's really by God's grace that he's well again. You see, to, to know that God is a healer is so important. Yes. Because in a crisis like that, some people just think, oh, it's one of those things, I probably would die. But you believe that Jesus could heal because you're exposed to this healing ministry. Yeah. Praise God. In desperation, I cry for the Holy Spirit. A very simple prayer that I welcome in this place, Holy Spirit. Mighty Father of mercy and of grace mm -hmm. Kept on crying that Tears came down And I knew that I had Established that relationship with God Praise God, praise the Lord And totally healed down On the sixth day by faith mm. 
we wanted to check out to a hotel. So, there was no nursing care. And the wife had to look after all the waste on the body. Mm. No hotel food, no drinks. Had to take taxi out to buy. But we said we will leave. The doctors make us sign all the non right. disclaimer form. Mm. He said, no oxygen. There's only one bag. The doctor was worried for you, yes. right? but he didn't know that you believe God yes. with all of your heart. Yes. That night, I had less than two hours of oxygen in the mm. bag. Mm -hmm. But we believe in God. For the first time, we had a wash, change of clothing, everything. I got food, slept. I had two dreams. One okay, of them. I don't think we could go into all that. Yes. Yeah, I read it, yeah. But, yeah, but praise thank, the Lord, yeah. thank God, it was a dangerous situation. You trusted God. You knew how to pray because you have been a gospel lighter. And what seemed to be like a death experience for you, yes. today you came out of it. Yeah, praise, praise God. Let's give Him praise. Let's give Him praise. Yes. Pastor, uh, the Lord healed a brother of this popping sound. Pastor, actually he has two conditions. One is tinnitus. That means he gives a buzzing sound in the ears. And for that, the Lord has healed him 60%. 60% healed. So he still has this buzzing sound, but... Two weeks ago, he developed another sound, popping sound. Mm -hmm. So, so he called up his bus IC. Well, he take the uh, Jurong East bus. He called called up the bus IC to pray for him. So, with the bus IC pray, and last Tuesday, I think Tuesday, Tuesday the Lord just healed him of all this popping sound. Now, no more popping you sound. You mean in the both ear. ears? You had the popping Only sound. Only the left ear. Or the left ear. Yes. Left Very ear. irritating, isn't yes, it? Correct. And non-stop. Yes. And now, totally, totally gone. gone. Oh, praise God. Praise God. We'll take you over to Tampanese now. Sister Nancy. Pastor, this sister, uh, before coming to the miracle service tonight, she had a, a feeling of tightness on her left thigh. So bad that uh, she's not able to move freely. It seems like a ton of load was on her thigh. So she came for the flexi uh praise and stretch service. Mm -hmm. While doing the stretches, uh, the, the exercises, she keep on claiming for God's healing. She mm. says, Lord, I receive your healing. I receive your healing. Praise now God. she's standing here to testify that, that tightness just leave her. Amen. Praise, Praise me to the Praise Lord. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Yeah, Pastor Tim. Yes, Pastor. This uncle wants to thank God for two miracles. On the 7th of March, he was scheduled to go for an operation, a heart bypass because of a heart attack. Thank God that the power lighter actually went to his place, prayed for him. And before the operation, on the 6th of March, he actually received the Lord into his life. And thank God the operation went through successfully. And now he's in a better condition. And praise God that through this process, the second miracle is his wife too came to know the Lord. He want to give God the glory for his healing. And also for two wonderful miracles. Praise God for that. Praise God. We'll bring you back here now. Yes. Pastor, for about a week, this sister has been having both back ache and stomach ache. And uh, she came here tonight having faith that God will heal her. And after the prayer, the pain was completely released. Praise God. Completely gone yes. tonight. Yes. How long did you say it was? Uh, one week. One whole week. One whole week. Uh -huh. See doctor and take medicine also not okay. And so in the service, uh -huh. The pain just... Yeah, and the behind her back. Now, sister, know, listen carefully. So, let's say you go out. Sometimes Satan will try to give you the symptoms. Mm. You must be bold enough to say, Satan, I reject it. You got to rebuke it. Mm. In whose name? Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Yes. Okay? Yeah. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Yes. Pastor, in December last year, the sister said... Uh, in fact, the doctor's report said there was a... Uh, Multi, multi modules on a toy, uh, thyroid gland. Okay. And then she said it's as big as a ping pong ball. Is, ping is pong. it hy hyper or hypo? Uh, it's is, not mentioned, it's just a multi modules. It's not, okay. okay, what she said was that that was in December in 2010. She came for the miracle service, and uh, the last scan on the 23rd of May said the, 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 the modules have actually shrunk. And she said, right now, there's nothing, all totally gone. Praise totally God. gone. Praise God. Oh, wonderful. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We'll, we'll take you over to Tampanese Pastor Henry. Uh, Pastor, this brother said last Saturday, uh, he's got this pain 
on his lower jaw. Three of his lower teeth was causing him a lot of pain, he said. In fact, the pain would shoot up to his head and he would have, I think, migraine of some sort. He came to the miracle service with the pain and during the miracle service, during the worship, then someone prayed for him and at the end of the miracle service, he said, all the pain lifted away. Ah, and wonderful. from that night till Praise now, God. it's completely healed. Praise the Lord. Amen. Over to you, Amen. Pastor. Okay, we'll bring you back here now, Pastor. Pastor. Uh, our brother Eric here For two months He has been suffering uh, Pain Tremendous pain He said And the ankle And she, he could not bend. Both ankle or one? Just one ankle Okay he, Right ankle He was dragging the feet he, And all the symptoms are, Were pointing to gout He ah. saw three doctors All three doctors Jumped into conclusion That it was uh, It's gout uh, It's gout you know, and then he went to the church Came very discouraged With all this And everybody was enjoying themselves And then um, He came back This uh, Thursday Just two days back He saw another doctor The doctor took uh, 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 Some blood test And confirmed that it was not gout mm-hmm. From that point on He said that He said that I believe that Jesus has healed me mm-hmm. By the strife of Jesus I am already healed mm-hmm. And he just claimed kept, kept claiming that verse And he said <laughs> Before long, he felt that he could, he, he could move his leg. Okay. And, he, and the best thing was, what did you do uh, yesterday? This morning. This morning. I went jogging. Ah, he went jogging the and there was no pain. Amen. He wants to give glory Amen. to God. Okay. Pastor, the Lord healed uh, this sister of the gout condition. Oh, gout. Mm. Yeah, Pastor, for two years she has this gout and it was behind the joint of the big toe, both legs, both, both feet, Pastor. Okay. And uh, she came with the pain. And because the last two days she this she she took some uh, bean okay. tau, bean 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 tau sa lo okay. and buns and things like that. It's a no no for those suffering from gout. Yes yes yeah. yes. So she came with the pain and tonight after prayer the Lord, the Lord just lifted all the pain. Now no more pain. In fact, all the pain are gone. Is gone. Oh yeah. praise God praise God. Yes. Pastor, uh, Sister Limoy is the do- daughter of of this uh, uh, sister here. For, for a long time, uh, this sister has been very, very worried because the mother has a very unique heart condition. She has a device that will keep the heart pumping correctly. Just oh, that, that device was that inserted some inserted time ago? Inserted in uh, 1999, okay. many years back. And then in 2007, the battery was weak. They had to change the battery. It was Obviously, they have to... Surgery. Surgery, a, okay. a, a small one. And it was successful. But this year, April... Something went uh, uh, awry. Um, the wire became loose, and the doctor told them that it, it could be a very complicated one because in order to in, in case the wire really came out loose, they have to pull it all out. It could be bleeding in the heart and could be very very dangerous. Okay. So, Sister Limoy started to pray and listed a cell group, sort like came in proxy pray for the mother, and then when she finally went for the for the procedure It was a breeze They found out That the wire Was just a little bit Out of place They, they could just Replace okay. another wire So she wanted to Give glory to God For that There was another condition In um, How many years back Was that? Two years back uh, She fell She actually had A total elbow Replacement oh. Actually that there is A, a titanium a, a, a piece of metal That is sitting here okay. Doctor said There is no way That she can Bend like this no way Because of that metal because piece Because of that metal piece It could just help her To, to do a little bit Of, of uh, house chores A little bit of movement But it could never Be able to bend like this And, 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 and she could dress herself in, in, in the way that she, she is doing now it, Even right to this, this day The doctor uh, amazed ex- Astonished that she could do all this So the doctor said that This is all the grace of God it, Is the metal piece still there? It, it is still there Okay, praise, praise God the Lord. Whatever it is <laughs> yeah. Yep Pastor, this sister found there is a 5.5 cm growth on the neck area. She's kneeing. Yes. Right. I, she testified before of nerve condition. No, right. right? Yeah. Uh, how many years ago? 22 years. 22 years okay. ago when you have this pain, even a wind blow on your face, That's right. it will be terrible pain. Yes. Right? Yes. And then your husband... Uh, brought you here yes, You yes, right. at first did not believe yes. And then you believe And all the pain that you suffered yes. Taken away Yes, but the memory of pain is lingering in my mind All the time 
the, yes. the memory of the pain. The pain yes. Why do you want to think about the pain? No, it keep coming to my mind. Okay, is that related to what she's going to share yes, now? Okay, yes. Joyce. So when she has this growth and she went to see a doctor, the doctor says that is she has to be operated, you know, uh, to The growth to where? On the on neck? The, on the neck. Okay, yeah, she's, okay. The doctor suspected that it could be cancerous. Okay. So she's, she felt very, very worried and, you know, uh, been coming to the miracle service for prayer and also activate the cell uh, group to pray for her. So she went for the operation and what she wanted to do is to give thanks to the Lord that the growth is non-cancerous. And, okay. you know, the, the, the operation was very uh, successful and there's no pain during the whole ordeal of the operation. No pain at all. But, but, but you were thinking, yeah, the, you were so horrified by the previous yes, pain when the you doctor suffer. suggested that to, to, because uh, I have to go for a biopsy. Right. There is no blood to take for sample. Uh -huh. So the doctor suggested to uh, go operation, take half of the thyroid while I'm on the operating table. Mm. So uh, to my mind, you open up my neck and then take up the sample to test whether cancerous or not. It's really frightened me, you know. Yes. But I quickly, at that moment, I pray to Jesus, Lord, it's in your hand already. Right. I surrender all to you, Lord, right. because you are my creator, my healer, right. my deliverer. So I keep praying, you know, then I told my cell group, my colleague, they all pray for me. There is, um, Wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> Praise good. God. Praise, Praise the Lord. Lord. Yes, the final one, right? Uh, Pastor, she said for the last two months or so, she experienced pain just below her neck region here, the spinal condition here. She said whatever, especially when she lift up or bring down the, the wooden poles for hanging, the, she, the pain will be very, very sharp. So she's been coming for the miracle service for the last uh, month or so, and she's been praying consistently, and she said progressively, the Lord has actually healed and delivered her with the pain condition. And when I ask her whether it's 100%, she says it's 90% healed. Praise God for that. If you lift up your hand, is it okay? It, Lift it up and no pain at all. No. Oh, wonderful. Okay. Yes. Oh, uh, one more testimony. Um, this sister has been coming to Lighthouse for six months, but yes. received Christ last Saturday. Okay. Uh, because of a friend, a faithful friend uh, has been bringing her. Mm. Uh, the friend is now in Tampines. But the, the testimony she wants to give the Lord, uh, uh, glory to God, is that last Saturday after receiving Christ, she prayed for a job. She has been looking for a job for three months. Oh, for three months, three months. Mm. but this Tuesday she received a job offer. She wants to give glory. All the oh, glory God is God. a good God. That's a good God. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Would you lift your hands? All lift your hands. Close your eyes for a while. Especially those of you who are still believing for a healing. Okay. In the name of Jesus, I speak healing into your bodies here and in Tampines. Father God, you are faithful. As they say with all of your hearts to you, Lord, and worship you, Lord, you do what man cannot do because we love you, we honor you, and we receive the best from you. Because you took our guilty place and you became so poor that we might be rich. You enrich us in our minds, in our physical bodies, in every way. Praise God. Wonderful God, we want to lift up your name in our midst because tonight we witness your grace and your mercy in our midst. We thank you, O oh God, for everyone who had responded to the altar call, who gave their life to our Lord Jesus. We thank you, O oh God, that spiritually there's new birth both here and at Tampines. Lord, we also want to thank Thee for all the healing touch, all those who have received a healing touch from You. Lord, we know that without Your presence, none of this is possible. And tonight, Lord, we return all the glory and honour to You because only You and You alone deserves it. So, Lord, we want to invoke Your blessings once more. Even as we make our way home, we pray, O oh God, that You will grant us journey mercy and bring us back here on the Lord's day to worship you. This is our prayer. We give thanks in Jesus' most precious and holy name. And let all God's people say, Amen. God bless you.